Hi, all. Can you hear me? Yes. We good? Yep. Can hear you. Great. Yep. Fantastic. Uh, I got 14 of you here. Was anybody confused about the message I gave for the labs today? Okay. Basically, what happened today? Because this is an enrollment week, uh, it doesn't make sense to give material out that I'm going to have to repeat again. So basically, the first day of labs is spent uh, just signing in. So I need you to email me to make sure that you are in the class. But uh, uh, other than that, you don't have to show up. We will have an orientation for both the online lab and the face-to-face -face lab on Thursday. We good with that? Sounds good. All right. Uh, how many of you, just as a poll, uh, you can, guys, you can go down to the, oh, where is it? Reactions. Okay. I want to know how many of you put a thumbs up if you are a transient student. That is you uh, are you normally are at another university you're just taking this course over the summer i need to know that if you wouldn't mind jana i've got a no okay no all right we're fine i'm sorry i meant to put yes <laughs> all right that's fine uh guys we're you're gonna to have to bear, those of you that are in the HCC system, you're gonna to have to bear with me because I have to kind of orient these other people into uh, Canvas, okay? Uh, all right, as soon as another person gets in here, Raylena. 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 Yes, hi. Hi, okay, I just emailed you back, okay? I need you to stay after class so I can explain what that's all about, okay? Thank you. Other thing, everybody, videos on. I need everybody to put their videos on. You will be having your videos on the whole time because basically I need to see reactions. If I don't see your faces, I can't see whether you're understanding material or not. So. Let's get those morning faces out there, guys. All right, thank you, thank you very much. So, I'm gonna go through, right now, I'm going to go through and call the roll. As soon as I pop up that screen. Okay. As soon as I pop up that screen, which is here, yay. People, where are people at? Okay, I'm not, if I, uh, so, so that's inactive. Jordan. Here. Thank you. Vanessa. Uh, Natalia. Here. Danny. Danny. Mr. Carmona. Benita. Benita. 
Jana, I think I saw you, right? Yep, here. All right. Absolutely perfect. Um, Daniela. Uh, Jenna. Ms. Fuller. Jennifer, are you here, Jennifer? I'm here. Glad to have you back, Jennifer. Uh, Manuel. Here. Uh, Parker. Here. Thank you, sir. Samantha, another person. Glad here. to have you back, Samantha. Glad to see you. Shari. Shari Hudson. Uh, Araceli. Here. Uh, Nicole. Nicole. Jessica. Uh, Keanu. Here. Thank you, sir. Uh, Valeria. Hi, Valeria. Here. Hi. How you doing? Good, and you? Doing great. Uh, Natalie. Here. Okay. Not too many more. Jana. Uh, Leonardo. Here. Uh, Natalie, other Natalie, Natalie Rendon. I got a Natalie Ocampo. And a Natalie Rendon, which one answered? Oh, I, it was Rendon, sorry. Thank you. Natalie, you're gonna be Natalie number one since the other one isn't here, okay? Natalie, you're number one. Okay. Sakari. Here, it's, it's Sachari. Sachari, Sa Chari. okay, I phonetically pronounce it. Raylena, you're here. Uh, Rhea? Here. Thank you. And Emily? Okay, going back again. No, first of all, let me get back to the meeting. Nope. Oh, God. Where are we at? Professor. There we are. Okay. Um, you didn't call my name. All right. When did you register? Um, last week. And your name? Anaya Rasul. Okay. I, I don't think I was. Ethan, called. I didn't, I did not call you either. Let me go back and look at my. <sighs> Ethan, you are in there. Sorry, I didn't go down far enough. There's also a Delexus. Delexus. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, the person whose name just began with an A, I've, I've, it's completely gone out of my head. Uh, what was your name again? Anaya. Anaya, last name? Russell. I got you. Okay, I may have butchered your name or I may have, I may have uh, just, just gone out, just flipped past it. Okay, that's fine. But you are on the roster. Okay, so Vanessa, Danny, Benita, Daniela, Jenna, Shari, Nicole, Jessica, Natalie Ocampo, Jana, Emily, Delexis, any of those people in here now? Good enough, guys. Okay, hi, I'm Mr. P. How you doing? We are doing okay? And I don't look so bored. Doing all right. <laughs> all right, guys, uh, my name is Mr. P. Professor P, Professor, don't call me doctor. I haven't earned that distinction. 
Anybody know what a PhD is? Come on, guys. This is a question and answer period. This is not. Go ahead, Ethan. Uh, it's a like doctor of like ph like philosophy. Like, well, I guess technically that's what it's like. But it's... no, Ethan. No, that's not what it is. Mm. A PhD is somebody that studies one subject for long enough that they eventually know everything about nothing. Guys, <laughs> the jokes do not get any better than this. This is the best I can do. So let's give you an idea, guys, about my background. I have a Bachelor in Science from West Virginia University. Uh, I got that way back in 1979. I have a Master's in Chemistry from University of Pittsburgh. I have a Bachelor of Arts in English. I went back when I was living in Miami, got my English degree from FIU. Then, ladies and gentlemen, I got my master's in education from USF. The real USF, not directionally challenged University of Florida. Come on, guys. Tampa is not South Florida. I've lived in South Florida. Believe me, it's not the same. Uh, Career-wise, I spent a year being a synthetic chemist. I basically made crystals in my hand. I had the only crystals in the world. I made 23 new compounds nobody had ever made before. Unfortunately, my boss said, hey, I want you to work with phosgene. Anybody know what phosgene is? You know it better as mustard gas. What mustard gas does is uh, mustard gas is able to uh, uh, take amino acids and link them together. Well, I'm starting to think to myself, hmm, my body's made of proteins and proteins are made of amino acids. Maybe this is not such a good idea that I'm working in phosgene, plus its reputation from World War I. So I quit that job. Somehow I wanted to live to be 63. Now that I'm 63, I'm not so sure. Uh, so I went from there, I went back to school, got my master's, then I went on to be a forensic scientist. I worked in crime labs for 27 years. I got to see dead bodies, guys. I worked in Miami, a place called Redding, California, where they have cows and tumbleweeds and nothing else. Then I moved back to Milwaukee, and finally I landed my dream job in Santa Rosa, California right smack dab in the middle of wine country. I was an hour away from my favorite city in the world, San Francisco. Loved it. I was absolutely in hog heaven. Five minute drive, I was at a winery. Ladies and gentlemen, do not have grandchildren. Grandchildren make you do stupid things. My wife wanted to be closer to her grandchildren, which means I moved to Tampa from Santa Rosa. Uh, Mention my wife, I've been married 31 years, have one daughter, three grandkids, one of whom is living with me right now, is in the same boat you are, is taking Zoom classes as a sophomore at FAU. So guys, what do I want, what, do I expect from you guys? What am I expecting here? Well, what is the half-life of carbon-14? Nobody? Nothing? Isn't there a formula for half-life? Yes, there is. We're going to learn it later on in the semester. Anything, guys? Do you have a way of looking it up? Yeah, I looked it yeah, up. It says 5,730. Perfect. Absolutely. How'd you get that information? I just looked it up. All right. You just look, you used what to look it up? Uh, Google. 
<laughs> Where did you put the Google information into? My computer. Oh, you just put it straight into your computer? Yeah. Do you have another device you could have looked that up in? Uh, my phone. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, leave your phones on. Believe it or not, you're important. You have lives. I don't want to make this a vacuum where you are totally removed from everything else in society while you're in here. Leave your phones on. Some teachers tell you to order you to turn them off. I can't take, I can't separate a mother from information about a child that may be happening even as we speak. So I want you to leave your phones on because that's very, very valuable information to me. Okay. Uh, I expect you to be prepared. Now, I put PowerPoints in the course, uh, course. I expect you to scan those over. I expect you to just glance through them before you arrive at class. To prove that you've done that, I will quiz you on it. I need you to read the text. I need you to do the homework. I have videos that are on the online schedule. I need you to be prepared because if you're prepared, you're going to be able to ask questions. If you're able to ask questions, that's going to make this a much better learning experience. I run an interactive class, which means I am going to be asking you questions. Some of you don't like that. I understand that you don't like it, but ask yourself this question. When I get in the real world, is my boss ever gonna put me on the spot and ask me a question that I have to come up with an answer for? How are you gonna get prepared for that moment unless somebody tests you on it throughout your scholastic career? I look at chemistry as not just a subject, but I look at it as a life learning experience. Why you take, anybody know why you're taking chemistry? Because it's required. Yeah, it's required. Why is it required? Are you, I'm sorry, is this Ethan? Who answered that question? Because it's no, required. I, I did. Uh, I'm sorry, who is this? Uh, Parker. Okay, Parker. Parker. Why do you think it's required? Are you, where, what do you want to be when you grow up? A veterinarian. Okay. How many, chance, how many times do you think veterinarians use chemistry in a day? A day of their life. How many times do you think chemistry is, is there? Probably pretty often. You think pretty often. You have a dog that comes in with a broken leg. You're going to use chemistry to diagnose or fix it? Probably not then. Okay. Yeah. Generally speaking, you are not, in any chosen profession that you have, you are not going to need chemistry. So why do they make you take it? They make you take it because you need to learn to think logically in a technical field. Because if you're required to take chemistry, more than likely you're going to have some other technical aspect for your career that you're going to have to learn. We have to be able to teach you to think logically in a technical field. That is my firm belief as to why you guys are taking chemistry. So that bottom line, you are gonna get asked questions. You are gonna have to diagnose things when you are in your chosen field. Somebody's gonna ask you questions. You gotta to learn to think on your feet. Uh, required materials, okay. In, Okay, I put the textbook in the syllabus as required reference material because veterans need to have that there in order for them to purchase the book through, uh, uh, through uh, their whatever means they do that. It is not an absolute necessity. It's a good idea. It's a very, very good idea because every new reference point that you have is good. Have I had students that have been able, uh, Samantha, Jennifer. Yeah. Uh, you, Samantha, you took me in lecture as well, right? Yeah. Jennifer, lab or just lecture? Lab. Okay. 
I'm, Samantha, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Were you able to get through the class without using the textbook? Yeah. All right. You can do it. It's a little bit harder, but you can do it. I strongly recommend that you buy the textbook. If you want to, you have to purchase the homework code anyway. When you purchase the homework code from Pearson, I've been told it's $60. When you purchase that, that gives you access to an e-text. So when you purchase the code, everybody is going to have the e-text at least. You need a computer with a camera. Is there anybody out there? Again, I'm gonna call up the, the list. If you do not have, if you do not have a computer with a camera, put the crying emoji. Go to the reactions, put the crying emoji. Okay, I'm scanning. Nobody has, everybody has a, everybody has a computer with a camera. You need it for, you need it for uh, the honor lock tests that have to be done. Okay, and Emily is now in here, as does Jana. Okay, so you need a computer with a camera. I want you to bring a calculator and a periodic table to each class. Uh, good idea, fantastic idea, guys. I put, I post the PowerPoints to Canvas. It's a good idea for you to print those out. You have a way of making six slides to a page Print the entire part. Yes, I know that the PowerPoints are long and very, very lengthy. If you print them out though, you won't be having to write unnecessary information. That's what PowerPoints were designed to do. Uh, for your good to know, there are tutors available at the library. I get a report every semester from the tutors, from the tutoring center saying who's, who's there and what they were basically asking. I'm going to present some material that you're not going to basically understand. So I'm sorry, I'm trying to look up Keanu. Okay, I'm going to, I am going to present some material you're not going to understand. I try to present it in various ways, but sometimes you just aren't on a one to one with me. Sometimes you can mind meld with somebody else. So I would strongly, absolutely strongly get to tutoring as quick as you can if you're not understanding something. Because basically, I had a chem student put, put it forth once very, very well. He said, chemistry is very, 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 very hard. Some of you guys are gonna try and bluff your way through this by not doing the work. You're not going to succeed. Uh, I do quiz you, I told you, I quiz you. Every time, every class that you don't have a test, you have a quiz, so just be prepared for that. The quizzes are going to be a combination of previously presented material and material I, have, I am going to cover during that day. I need you to look through the PowerPoints to answer those other five questions in the quiz so that you have a foundation, that you have a foundation of for me to present the material. If you have a foundation, then you're going to understand the material that much easier. Best way to prepare for the quiz is look at the PowerPoints. In the canvas, I provide something I call the online outline. The amazing thing is my students in my intro class that I just finished, they basically said, oh, the online outline, I never knew this existed. 
So that's why I'm sitting here emphasizing it today. In that online outline, in the online outline, there is a listing towards the pages in the text. That is the hardcover text. There is a reference to the slides that that subject is covered in the PowerPoint. And I also include a video. Again, you can't get to a tutor, go to the online outline, look at the video. Maybe that will help you. Be aware, I do provide practice tests, but I reserve the right to change the questions for the actual test. In other words, I, I'm going to use different variables or I could rearrange the question. For example, if the practice test has, what is the density of something that weighs so much and has a volume of so much? The actual test question would be, what is the volume of something weighs this much and has a density of this much? Campus hours. My office hours are Mon a Tuesday and Thursday, they are from 9.30 to 10 o'clock. I will open the Zoom meetings early. If you want to talk to me, I will be available from 9.30 through 10 o'clock. Uh, contact. Best way to contact me is through the email system. I answer emails generally in the morning. That's not gonna happen today. Everybody that's emailed me yesterday, I'll be going through the emails this evening. But I do try and get onto the emails each day. What that means is if I answer the emails in the morning, you're not gonna get an answer if you email me in the afternoon until the next day. If you have an emergency, and guys, I mean, an emergency means something to the effect of, Mr. Popovich, you put a wrong answer in the quiz. That's an emergency for me because the faster I can fix that, the less work I have to do. If you have an emergency, my cell phone number is 707-843-1305. Again, cell phone. 707-843-1305. This is in the syllabus, by the way. Now, I just lost my cell phone this weekend and I am notorious for not carrying my cell phone with me. So that is not the best number to call me. The best number to call me is my home phone number, yes, I'm an old fart. Yes, I still have a landline. That number is 727-202-7275. Put this number in quotations. 727-202-7275. If you have, if you need call me, guys, I really don't get a lot of calls from you, which is a good thing but I don't get a lot of calls from you. That's why I can keep on publishing my numbers to you. Some important dates. This Friday is the last day to drop with a refund. In other words, if you don't like what you're hearing from me today, you could drop up until this Friday. The other date is the dropping with a W. And I'm going to have to get onto my website for a second so that I can call up the syllabus to give the exact date for this because I don't have that memorized. By the way, Ethan, thank you for telling me about that I didn't put the scale in for the grades. I'm emailing E, doing it down. No, 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 no. Last date of drop withdrawal without a refund is June 28th. Please, guys, please, if you are thinking about not doing any more work for the semester, please uh, withdraw. 
because that saves me a whole lot of work. We also have a couple of holidays. Uh, May 31st is Memorial Day. July 5th is uh, Independence Day. So you will not have to attend class. Those are Mondays. You're not gonna have to worry about attending class those days. We're not gonna have to worry about that here. I take attendance each day, guys. Attendance is part of your participation grade. Some general ins instructions when you leave the class, please do not note, don't note that Mr. Popovich, I have to go away from the screen for a second because I have to go to the bathroom. That really is entirely too much information for me. You have to answer your phone do anything else. If you have to go and munch on a sandwich for because you're glucose uh, deprived, get off of the screen, go away, do it as quick as possible, then come back. Again, expect that I will be interacting with you. And we have that. Any questions so far, ladies and gentlemen? All right, we're gonna go through, we're gonna go through the, uh, I'm gonna save screen now or share screen now. And are you seeing the syllabus ladies and gentlemen? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm gonna get out of that for a second cause I wanna go through the, I'm gonna go through the through the course, through the, uh, this is the computer stuff. If you guys that are, are from HCC want to click off for a second, go ahead. Home is basically, you're going to see the syllabus page gets, gets highlighted when you hit the home. Syllabus, this is where you're going to access the syllabus. Please do not print out the syllabus. I already know that I have to go in there and put the grading scale in there. Also on the syllabus page is a tentative schedule. In the tentative schedule, I have an unplanned day. This is not that we are not meeting that day. We are meeting that day. I just have tried to put vacuum days in there so that if I'm behind schedule, I can easily make it up because I've already planned for that. The announcement page, each week, each Sunday by five o'clock, I will put in the announcement page, the uh, uh, assignments that you have due that week. I also will copy and paste those assignments into an email and forward that to you. So you have two methods of learning. Let's do that, actually three methods. Because you also, if you look at the home page, the home page has a course summary after it, and that will tell you due dates as well. So, no excuses for missing assignments. I will do that each week. I will put it in and make an announcement of the assignments and send an email. Modules are the guts of the class. Each chapter has its own separate module. If you go in and click on the subject matter for the module, you will have PowerPoints. Some I'm presenting, some I may not. There's gonna be a section, I have extra problems. Now, you, I told you, you do have to purchase the homework code for $60 to get onto my lab of mastering. That is the graded homework. This extra problems, those more are more in line with some of my test questions because I looked at the questions for the extra problems. The MyLab and Mastering words things a little bit differently. 
but because this is an online class, and because the last time I tried to have homework submitted to me, it was an absolute disaster. I had 300 emails in one week. I have to go by other means. Therefore, you are going to have to access this, uh, the homework by my lab and mastering. The third concept is the online outline. In the online outline, and I got to move my pictures. You're going to find you're going to find a comment on what slides of the PowerPoint. Understand that I edit my PowerPoints regularly, so they may not be the slide numbers may not be exact. I also give you a video. These are divided into the individual struct uh, individual subjects. I give you a video. I try to limit the video time to somewhere less than 10 minutes. It doesn't always work because sometimes the subject matter is that intense. So if you need extra teaching, extra instruction, go and access the videos. If not, I would also suggest the Organic Tutor or Khan Academy. Organic Tutor, I like a little better than Khan Academy. Both work for me. Any questions about the online outline or the individual modules? Professor, I have a question. I'm here. Um, what exactly do we need to print out? Or like you said the PowerPoints are the- I suggested, Araceli, oh. I suggested that you print out the PowerPoints. Okay. Uh, this is basically how PowerPoints were designed. You, when, I, when PowerPoints first were introduced, you would go to a class and you'd get this big, thick binder. The th binder had all the PowerPoints printed out six to a page. Okay. And what this enabled you to do was it enabled you to follow along with the PowerPoints and jot down notes so that you didn't have to write everything down yourself. Okay, that's what I was suggesting, Araceli. Okay, and the worksheets as well, or, or will we have certain worksheets for um, for each chapter or like problems, you know, because I- I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Okay. The worksheets, I have extra problems here, Araceli. The extra problems are not graded. They're just an effort for me to give you a little extra work if you want it to try and master the subject matter a little better. Make sense, Araceli? Yes, makes okay. sense. Any other questions about the modules? Next section or quizzes. This is where you are going to access the tests and the individual quizzes. The quizzes have dates, due dates on them. Your first quiz is due on the 20th of May. Okay, so you have, by Thursday, you have to do quiz one. All the quizzes have due dates. If you notice though, actually the, yeah, I'm sorry, excuse me. The test dates are a little screwed. So you are going to have to, you're gonna have, you're gonna have to wait for the test dates for me to put those in there. But then again, you don't have to access them till they're due. If you call up a quiz, most of the quizzes are going to be short answer, very rare short answer. You will have mostly multiple choice, a lot of true false. But basically, they're going to be just like this. Sorry. Oh, okay. They're just going to be this is the first quiz. First quiz is a little bit different. Actually, no, it's not. Um, you have the first five questions here that are involving harder questions that I'm going to go over in the material I present during the first lecture. From six on, those are gonna be questions on material that you have to review. I'm not 
going to go through heating ice to steam today. That's something you can look at the PowerPoint and find that information. Questions about the quizzes? My lab and mastering. If you click on that, it's not going to lead you to this page because this is this is my page. I'm already registered. First page will happen. You come up to the registration page. It will lead you through uh, uploading into my lab and mastering. There is a grace period. So if you're like a veteran and you're not going to get paid for this until two weeks from now, there is a grace period. But beware, at the end of that grace period, it will shut off on you. Uh, it, you can purchase the code through the bookstore or purchase it directly here through my lab and mastering. I believe it's cheaper online. The discussions. Okay. I have, right now I have what I'm calling the scavenger hunt. The scavenger hunt is nothing more than 10 simple questions. I want you to kind of get to know each other. So I've devised, devised this thing. I need you to get on by Sunday at five o'clock. You need to answer these 10 questions in one response. Basically, what you do when you are responding to this, all you got to do, hit the reply button. It will open a text box, type in something, and post reply. It is then in there. If you want to, you can create a new thread by hitting the plus discussion button. Let me see if that will work. Yes. If you hit the plus discussion box, that will open up an entire new thread. If you just go to one of these, if you just go to one of these particular responses, then it will create a thread. First week, we're gonna have response to the scavenger hunt. Second week, you are going to have response to the answers. And what that is gonna involve is, I'm gonna take the 10 questions. I'm gonna take your answers to the 10 questions and I'm gonna create 10 new questions. So like, basically for the where you were born question, I'm gonna look at everybody's answer and the question I'm gonna have a week from now is, who was born the furthest from Tampa? Okay. And I am going to come up with my own answers for these 10 questions. I'm gonna compare them to you and the person that gets the most right wins five extra points, extra credit points for the quizzes. So this week, this Sunday, you're gonna have one response Next Sunday, you're going to have one response. What if there's a tie? What if there's a tie? I split the points. Uh, I can see where your mind is going. All right. Uh, this week, this Sunday, one response. The next Sunday, one response. After that, you have to respond to the discussion forum three times a week. Basically, it is going to involve, you can ask a question in the discussion forum. That counts as a response. Questioning something counts as a response. Answering somebody else's question counts as a response. So you have to do three a week. And literally speaking, when I did this last fall, people loved it because they were able to get answers to their questions in a faster manner. The other thing about the discussions that I want to mention is there is a discussion 
I'm going to put it to the top of the page in a second. I'm going to call it student forum. Let's see if that worked. No, 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 no. I don't want you there. I want you here. I'll fix it. I will fix it. Student forum is where you can answer, ask questions to the class. Uh, and you can answer those questions. It will count as a response to the forum for that particular week. Uh, I also will submit three problems a week based upon, uh, I will submit three, three problems and basically they're literally, I'll pull them out of those uh, homework questions, those extra homework questions that I have. So this is kind of the point. If you have nothing to think about writing about, you can just answer the problems. Questions about the discussions. Grades, that's where you're gonna look for your grade book. This is gonna be different from yours, but you're gonna be able to access your grades there. All right. Uh, People, I think you can look on this, click the people thing. And I believe you might be able to email people through this. I'm not entirely certain. Uh, that's basically it here, guys. Anybody have any question about manipulation of Canvas? With that having been said, we're gonna to go to the syllabus. Now, are you seeing something that says syllabus here? Thank you, Araceli. Again, in the syllabus, I give you my office hours. The office hours are in Zoom. It should be 9.30 to 10 o'clock. Uh, oops, did I screw up today, guys? Is the class supposed to meet at 10.15? Come on, talk to me. Is the class supposed yeah. to meet at 10.15? Hey. Yeah, 10.15. Okay. I mean, that's, that's, yeah, that's, it's not on the syllabus, so like. Same here. I got right, a little bit confused bad. when you said 10. But, but. I, I will check on it, guys, and I will check on it. Know that my the meeting is going to the Zoom meeting is going to start at 9:30, but if the scheduled class time is 10:15, I will check on that. Um, then the actual class will start at 10:15. Oh, um, also, I think since you took attendance like before 10:15, some people I've, that might have been missing. I will go like, on. I will go. I will ask the the people that I've got marked absent. I will I will go through and see that those people are are there. Oh, okay. by the way, when I went through the list, did any is there anybody whose name I did not call? Finest kind, great. Uh, basically, the next part of the syllabus is just crap that we have to put in there. Gives you the textbook and the required materials. Now this is my screw up. Uh, this tells you the grade exam system tells you how you're going to be evaluated. Three semester exams, 150 points each. The final is 150 points. There are 15 chapter quizzes. Actually, excuse me, I'm lying. There are 17. 15 that are online right now. Throughout the semester, I will give you two pop quizzes. The homework is worth 150 and your class participation grade is 100. Grading scale that I have to list is a straight 90, 80, 70, 60. I reserve the right to lower the scale 
but I promise you that I will not raise it. What that means is I have the ability to say, oh, you have an 87 in the class. Okay, I, my tests were hard. The averages were down a little bit. So I'm gonna lower an A to a third 87. But I can't say, oh, you, you guys really blitzed us. You did a great job. So therefore, I'm gonna have to raise it so I don't give out as many A's. So that an A is now down to only 93. I will not do that. I will, I can lower it to an 87. I will not raise it to a 93. Now understand, 87 is the lowest I will, I will go. If you got a final, if your final total is 86.99, don't even ask. You haven't received the 87 because in effect, I've already lowered the A three percentage points. Uh, yeah, that's all I have to say there. Chapter quizzes. I've talked about it a little bit. Understand, don't even ask for a late submission. All of the, all of the quizzes are designed to be turned in by 9 a.m. on the day the quiz is due. All right, I put the correct answers in at 9.30. So you're asking to do the quiz at that point is a moot point because you've already had access to the answers. In lieu of missing a quiz, I drop two quiz results. So you can miss two quizzes and those results will be dropped. There are 15 total quizzes two pop quizzes. So there'll be 17, 15 of those 17 will count. Questions about the quizzes? Homework. I, homework is worth on, <laughs> Homework is worth 150 points. Now, I grade homework on the basis of quantity attempted and quality of the work. So basically, all you have to do is attempt all of the questions, you get 75 points. I grade it out of the total number of questions that are in the assignment, and I have a way of knowing how many you've actually completed. So that's 75 points. The, my lab will also tell me of the total number of points that were offered, it will tell me how many of those points you got right. That's the other half of the homework grade. Now I've looked at Pearson. What Pearson has done throughout the years, they have evaluated how long it takes students to do particular questions. And they've averaged those out. So I see that number. That's the number I use to come up with the, um, come up with the amount of homework you're doing. And that's also the amount that I use for the amount of points per question. If it should take you two minutes to do the question, it's worth two points. 15 minutes, 15 points. Questions about the homework. Please guys, I had a girl last semester. Uh, her overall grade going into the final was an F but with the homework and with the final, she could have pulled that up to a C by just getting a B on the final. She never signed up for the homework. So there was no possibility. Please sign up for the homework. It's worth 100, it's worth 15% of your grade. You can't survive that kind of a hit. 
exams. I give three semester exams. On the day of the exam, there'll be no lecture because basically at that point, you're brain dead. Now the exams, when I enter them into the grade book, they're worth 150 points. So understand when I put the grade into the grade book, that is the point value, not the percentage. So if you see a 90, that's not necessarily a good news. Test questions are going to consist of numerical word problems. You're going to have to interpret graphs and you need to understand there are something I call thinking questions. An example of a thinking question. Your pressure, your pressure is one atmosphere and at that pressure, your volume is one liter. If I keep the moles and the temperature constant, and raise the pressure to two liters, should the volume go up or down? You see, this is where I pose the question and somebody answers me. This is how it works. Come on, guys. Pressure increases. What happens to the volume? Boils law. I guess it goes down. Well, volume it goes down but you understand what I'm talking about when I, I'm saying a thinking question. Yeah. I and pose a question like that and you're going to have to logically work your way through it and come up with an answer. Exams are open book. You're allowed all resources except your cell phones, another browser and any practice tests that I have. Ladies and gentlemen, I had a student last semester that while he was taking honor lock accessed Chegg. And I am looking through the review of this kid's test and I'm thinking you actually accessed Chegg while you're taking the test? You're not allowed to use another browser. Honor lock will catch you. Guys, if there is talking, specific conversation between you and another individual while you are taking a test, what happens is you will get flagged an honor lock. I will then look at that particular minute of your, of your recording and believe it or not, guys, I heard somebody talking with somebody else about specific test questions. They had a laptop. I could see the very corner of the laptop that was next to them. Guys, I'll be honest with you. It's fairly easy to cheat on honor lock, but please be a little more ingenious than that. I had another, I had another set of two students. They submitted the same exact question, the same exact answers, the entire test. I asked the question, that same question, uh, give an example of Boyle's law in reality. And I, I gave them an extra point, extra credit, if they came up with an example other than the one I mentioned in class. And the students, what they did was they said, okay, I can do a numerical representation of it and prove numerically how it, it works. That was fine for me. I gave them the question. One pair of students had the first volume be 7.134 liters. I ask you, how what are the chances that two people independently are going to come up with 7.134 liters? This flagged their test to me. I then went through the entire process. It took me about an hour and a half. And I documented that they copied the same exact tests. Be aware, guys. If you do cheat, I have to notify student services the Dean of Student Services. 
You don't want that on your academic record. But on the whole, I consider the exams to be an open book. You can have anything there except another browser, a practice test, or a cell phone. Understand this. You're allowed to have a hard copy book in front of you. If you make the, if you make the decision to use the ebook, I'm sorry, but you're not allowed to use the text because that would entail using another browser. Uh, what else? If you score, Samantha, what happens if you score greater than 90% on all the individual exams? I don't remember. Did you take the final, Samantha? Yeah. You took the final? Uh, yeah. I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I thought that I thought that I remembered you didn't. If you score, if your raw score on each individual exam is 90% or better, that means you do not have to take the final. What I will do is I will average your three exam grades and input that as your final exam score. Understand that raw score means the percentage before any extra credit or a curve is applied. If the average on the test class-wide is less than 75%, you will get an extra credit question. So what that will entail is I will subtract the class average from 75. Say it, your average is 67. 75 minus 67 is eight. I multiply 8% 8 by 150. This means that the extra credit will be worth 12%. Do we understand that? All right, is anybody planning on going on vacation for two weeks or more? Don't do it. That's a quarter of the class. You signed up for 10 weeks from now until July 22nd. Anybody going to have a wedding that they're going to have to attend? Good, so everybody is gonna be here for the tests. I only give makeup exams if you ask me in advance, or if a verified emergency happened during that day. This is why, another, another gimme point I have for you, if you do better on the final than any, of the, than any one of the individual exam scores, the final will replace your worst exam score. So each exam is 150 points for a total of 450. The finals on July 20, 22nd, and again, it will replace a, an individual exam score if that individual exam is lower. Class participation. 50% of your participation grade is administered through direct question. If you're in your lab, I am going to question, if you're in lecture, I am going to question you. So half of your participation grade is based upon that. You attend, you get the participation score. The other half is based on your response in the forum, the chat room. Three responses a week. So therefore, if you respond three times in a week, you're going to get those 50 points. Look at it, guys. I'm giving you basically just showing up and just responding in the form. You got 100 points. Just doing the homework is another 75. If you do well in the homework, that's extra points. But just points I'm giving you, that's 17 and a half percent of your grade. That's almost two grade points that basically all you got to do is show up and do your work.
extra credit. If I deem that you guys are plagiarizing, in other words, copying each other's answers, I have the right to discontinue extra credit. Any score, quiz, test, or otherwise, any score can be contested until one week past its entry into the grade book. After that, it will be considered permanent. Because guys, amazingly enough, in July, on July 13th, I'm not gonna remember what I was thinking on June 7th when I graded your test. I don't submit late, I don't allow late reports. Quiz answers are submitted uh, within two hours of the submission point. The rest of the stuff, oh, one thing. One thing I wanna mention, I, I basically the rest of the stuff is information you can read through. I don't necessarily have to, to, um, to uh, address it at this point. Read through the syllabus. All right, if you do have a disability, I will accommodate you. You will get whatever the accommodation is required. I will do that. I do make one request. If you do have a disability, please remind me around test time, email me that Mr. Popovich, remember I have accommodations. Would you please uh, uh, upload them? Because guys, you're better in charge of yourself than I am. Right now, I'm teaching five classes. I probably have well over 100 students. It's hard for me to keep track of each one of the 100. Uh, any questions, guys? Questions got, on anything? I got a question regarding um, the molecular approach textbook. Yes. Um, so what if we have the textbook? Can we buy the access code separately? Or yes. is it, oh, okay. okay. Yes, there was Sally. All you need to do is go into the My Lab and Mastering. Uh, that would be not here. That would be, nope. Sorry, close, yes. Do you see the My Lab and Mastering button in the module? That's where you would access it. They lead you straight through it, okay? Another thing, ladies and gentlemen, that just popped in my head. I do not put a code for the honor lock. So if you're getting into, if you're trying to take the test and it's saying to input a code, that is a mistake. One of the things that can happen is I may have forgot to enable the test. That is very important. If you get the fact that you need to put input a code, call me right away. Call me because I need to get in there and enable the test so that everybody can take it. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? If that is the case, then um, we're gonna have, what is reasonable? Five minutes, five minutes reasonable. Guys, five minutes reasonable. Somebody say yes. Yes, that's fine. Uh, All right, five minutes, we're gonna come back and I'm gonna give the first lecture on intermolecular forces. If you've had, if you had Chem 1, some Chem 1 courses go all the way through uh, solution chemistry. So be aware of that. And some of this material may be repeated. Okay, uh, five minutes. That would be, I'm going looking at 11.10. What's that? Um, do, you, do you base your class off sig figs? Like, um... Absolutely, Anaya. If you have, especially, Anaya, are you taking the lab? Yeah. All right, what I tell, what I tell my introductory students, Anaya, 
I tell them, I, I, the thing that I take most points away for on labs especially is significant figures. So learn it now. I repeat that lesson in Chem 1. I'll repeat it here. I take most of my points, most of the points I take off are significant figures. If you need help with it, Anaya, I'll be happy to go through it with you. Okay, thank you. Uh, but you're going to do, you're going to log in early next week. Okay. Okay. Anything else, guys? Yes, concerning the attendance. Yeah. Are you going to check it again later on? Yep. Because the one time we had, or you're going to do it now? I'll check it on later on. And concerning the homework, um, the best way to log in would be just as you said it, just going through Canvas and. As far as I know, that's the only way you can log in. It's okay. the only way that you can log in that will correlate your grade to my grade book. Okay. All right. If you don't do it that way, then you're going to be doing the homework, but you're not going to be getting credit for it. Who's got the Steelers? Sh Sam? Yeah. You're from Pittsburgh? No, my friend is. Ah. So your friend is blessed and you're not. Unfortunately, yes. All right, guys, I'm looking. It's 1112. By 1117, I'm going to be back starting, okay? So basically, you've got it, you're just waiting for it to get paper. Okay, now I want to, no, it is.
is in here. Search for classes. All right. No, let me do this. Mm, I like this method better. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, videos back on. Videos back on. Danny, video on. Uh, Sacheri, I need to know who iPhone is. Emily, video on. I need to know who iPhone is. I'll mention it again in a second or two. I'm iPhone. I'm Benita. I'm at the doctor's office right now. You're at what? I'm at the doctor's office. I sent okay. you a message. Uh, Benita, I didn't get a chance to look at my emails this morning. Okay. That's okay. Sorry. All right. I, the reason I needed to identify you is a while back, there was a hacker that was in in uh, uh, was being charged with a crime. And in open court, uh, one of his friends had hacked into the court system and sent pornography through there. So I just need to identify you. That's, that's part of what the waiting room is. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be dealing with intermolecular forces. Now, when I give a PowerPoint, the first, the first slide generally lists the major topics I'm going to go over in that particular PowerPoint. If you look at the online outline, generally speaking, the 
subjects are going to match to the uh, chapter outline. So we're going to talk about inner and intramolecular forces. We're going to deal with Coulomb's law. We're going to talk specifically about the intermolecular forces, which are dispersion, dipole, dipole, hydrogen bonding, ion dipole. We're going to deal with vaporization and vapor pressure, energies of phase changes. We're going to deal with phase diagrams. And the last thing we're going to talk about are cohesive forces. Guys, intermolecular forces are great. The reason they are great is they help explain so much. Up to this point, you've been just told, oh, uh, water gains heat when you add energy to it. Up to this point, you haven't learned why. Now you're going to learn the why behind a lot of the things that are occurring. You're gonna learn why chemical reactions occur. So this all starts off with something called electrostatic forces. And simply speaking, electrostatic forces are nothing more than a positive and a negative attracting one another. A positive and a positive repelling each other. So that's basically what an electrostatic force is. And there are two types. There is an intramolecular force and there is an intermolecular force. Now, Natalia, have you ever driven out of state? Yes. All right, what kind of a road were, what did they call the road you were on? What does that I in front of 75 stand for? Interstate. Interstate, so does the highway go between states? Yes. So, intermolecular forces are between the forces between two different molecules. Mm -hmm. Intra, they're not labeled as such, but literally speaking, there are some Florida roads. Those Florida highways are intra state roads. Those are the roads that are only within Florida. So intramolecular forces are those forces that involve in the actual molecule itself. Uh, I'm only going to invite, I'm only going to go do this one more time. Emily, I need you to, need you to visual, put your visual on. Uh, I don't have one. I didn't know we had to have webcams, so I have to go buy one. Okay. Good enough. All right, so that's the difference between the two, intra and intra. Intra are the forces that bond, that make a molecule a molecule. They're the forces that keep the molecule together. Now, if we're, these are the forces that are keeping a molecule together, these are also the forces that determine the chemical properties. In order to make a new molecule out of an old one, you have to break all those chemical bonds. When you break those chemical bonds, you are breaking intramolecular forces. If you have enough energy to break those bonds, you, a chemical reaction has a possibility of occurring. Now, when you are forming a new one, you're also involving intramolecular forces. And on the basis of whether you release energy when you're making those new bonds, as opposed to the old bonds, that goes a good deal into determining whether a reaction happens, uh, happens or not. So intramolecular forces are the forces that are responsible for chemical properties. In turn, these are the forces that exist between one molecule to another. These forces are going to determine physical properties. Can I ask you a question? Uh, we're going to go with Manuel. 
Would you say the molecules are closer in a gas or if you take that same molecule and make it into a solid? Which one has the, the closer force? Uh, the solid. Okay, so we're changing states. The force between the solid is stronger. So that's why it is a solid. If we add energy to that, then we are moving one molecule away from each other and we're going to the liquid phase, then we're going to the gas phase. Intermolecular forces determine the, uh, they determine the uh, state of matter and the physical properties. Now, this is all dependent on Coulomb's law. Now, I hesitate to say this because I know people blow it off once I say it. You are not gonna have to do any numbers problems that involve Coulomb's law, mainly because they're esoteric and they're not gonna help you understand what I need you to understand. Now, in Coulomb's law, it states that the force is equal to a constant times the charge on the first particle times the charge on the second particle divided by the radius between the two squared. So if the charges are opposite, then you have a negative force. If you have a negative force, it is exothermic. If the charges are the same, then your E is positive. And if it's positive, then you have an endothermic point. All right? So in other words, it takes energy to push two things that are positive charged together. You need to put energy into that to make it work. Now look at this formula. I'm saying that the force is directly related to the amount of charge on each particle, but the force is indirectly related to the distance between them. So ultimately this is saying, if I have a charge of two versus a charge of one, if both particles have a charge of two, I'm going to get four times the force than if both of those articles have one. So the more the force increases, I'm sorry, the more the charge increases, the force is also going to increase. Radius is indirectly. And you know this intuitively. If you've got a magnet that's this close, is there a lot of force that's exerted? as opposed to a magnet that is that far apart. The further you put these things away, the less force they exert on one another. So the force gets decreased as the radius goes up. And by the way, that's just an example of why I don't, of what, how I do not read from the PowerPoints. So let's think about this. I have magnesium sulfide. I have sodium chloride. And I have aluminum phosphate. What's the charge on magnesium and sulfur? Come on, guys, this is intro. Magnesium is uh, positive. Positive what? Positive two. two. Sulfur is positive. a negative? Negative two. two. OK, how about sodium? What's sodium? Uh, positive positive one. one. Chlorine? Negative one. Negative one. Negative one. Aluminum? Positive three. Uh, Phosphorus? Negative, negative three. three. If you look at the periodic table, these are all on the same row. So they pretty much have the same radius. Now, the only since they have about the same radius, 
in my Coulomb's law formula, the radius isn't going to be really applicable. All we're dealing with is the charge. So since I am dealing with, sorry, one second. I have no idea how that went to there. Where'd my slide go? There it is. Okay. Since I'm dealing with a positive two, negative two, positive one, negative one, positive three, negative three, which one has the highest charge? Which compound has the highest charge relationship? The aluminum phosphorus. Somebody who answers sodium chloride, that's only a one to one. The aluminum phosphate is a three to three. That has much more charge. So you have a much stronger bond, much more force that's associated with aluminum phosphorus versus sodium chloride. So which one would you expect you have to put more energy into to change it from a solid to a liquid? Aluminum phosphorus. Aluminum phosphate. A fo aluminum phosphate. phosphate, yeah. Phosph aluminum phosphate. Yeah. Right. I, I, caught, I caught myself. So aluminum phosphate, because it has a larger charge, there is a stronger force between the aluminum and the phosphorus than there is between the sodium and the chloride. Therefore, I'm going to have to put more energy into the aluminum phosphate to get that to melt. Does this make sense, guys? Are we good with this? This is what I'm at. Well, this is what I mean by a thinking question. I can list these three compounds and ask which one has the higher melting point. Now, if the molecules are further apart, you're going to have less force because we're dividing by the radius. So if I have sodium chloride versus potassium bromide versus rubinium iodide, which one is the smallest? Which one is the largest? Bring your periodic tables, guys. Would it be the rubidium iodine? Is the is the biggest. Rubidium iodide is the biggest. Sodium chloride is the smallest. So because so each one of them is a plus one minus one. So the charge isn't going to affect this. But sodium chloride, the sodium is closer to the chloride than rubidium iodide is. If they're closer, then it's going to take, there's a greater force because the radius is smaller. If the radius is smaller, less force. So, I'm sorry, if the radius is smaller, more force. So you are gonna have to impart more energy to get that to melt. Again, is this making sense to you? Confusion, any confusion about this? No, I just have a question. Please. Uh, does this go back to like in Gen Chem 1 with the uh, electronegativity, like as you're going like through the periodic table? No, this has more to do with the... Oh, <sighs> no, not really. Okay. We're dealing more with the radius, which is also a periodic trend, but it has more to do with radius than it does electronegativity. Okay. So the so the lower, like, as you go down the periodic table, the bigger the element? Is that Absolutely, because okay. what's happening is you're adding another shell worth of electrons. If you add another shell, that last shell is further away from the nucleus. Okay, thank you. Now, to determine whether something becomes a solid, liquid, and a gas, we have a battle going on, guys. First of all, we have a force. 
A force wants to keep a positive with a negative, right? So we have those intermolecular attractions, Coulomb's law, that is trying to keep things as close as possible. By the same token, we're putting energy in there. When we put energy in, we're making the molecules excited. If we make them excited enough, that breaks them away from one another. So the thing we have to understand is that something is a solid, liquid, or a gas because of the battle between the intermolecular attractions and the kinetic energy that the individual molecules have. Remember, kinetic energy is related to the velocity of the molecules, which is directly related to the temperature. So if we have a gas, a gas, the molecules are not really related to one another. This means that the kinetic energy has overcome the intermolecular forces. If we have a liquid, then the kinetic energy is moderately greater than the intermolecular attractions. But if we have a solid, this means that the kinetic energy is less than the intermolecular attractions. So the properties, these are the properties of the state of matter. These are what are related to that battle between the kinetic energy and the molecular energy. If you have a high density, high densities imply that the molecules are close to one another. This means that the intermolecular forces are greater than the kinetic energy. On the other hand, uh, if you have a volume, if you have a high kinetic energy, you're gonna have a big volume of this stuff. So you have a higher kinetic energy than you do for a, for a uh, solid. So that's what makes a substance, a liquid, solid, or gas. It's basically de dependent upon the temperature, which means that the kinetic energy is increased at higher temperatures, decreased at low temperatures. The intermolecular forces are pretty much static depending upon the radius. The radius is going to depend upon the kinetic energy. So what is making up the intermolecular forces? Remember, we're dealing with Coulomb's law, so we're dealing with charges. So the charges we have to, we have to consider are partial charges, permanent charges, Number one, should read permanent. Permanent charges, partial charges, and temporary charges. There, we have to consider each one of these. Now, if we're dealing with inter versus intramolecular forces, if I was going to draw a molecule, and I just happen to have done that, intermolecular forces, the molecules are about 300 picometers apart. But if I'm looking at the intramolecular forces, those are only 96 picometers apart. So which one is going to exert the most force, the inter at 300 picometers or the intra at 96? Intra? Intra is going to exert the most force because the distance is smaller. So we have four types of intermolecular forces. First one is called dispersion. London or Van der Waals. Pick a name, guys. If you see something called Van der Waals, we're talking about the same thing as dispersion. If you see something called 
uh, London forces, it's also dispersion. That's one type of intermolecular force. Second type is called a dipole-dipole. Third is something called hydrogen bonding. It's not really bonding, but it's just a strong dipole-dipole. And the last one is something called an iron dipole. Now, when we are dealing with dispersion forces, it is present. Dispersion forces are present in all molecules and atoms. And what it results from are changes in the electron within the molecule. These are temporary dipole moments. A dipole moment means that you have a difference in charges. You have a positive end and a negative end. That's what makes a dipole moment. Would you agree that electrons are randomly distributed in a molecule? Jana, would you agree that? Jana? Yes, sorry. I right. think Jana, you would agree I that sure. normally electrons are randomly distributed, right? Yes. Okay. Is it possible that the electrons are on the same side of the molecule at one given time? Is that a possibility? Yes. So if the electrons are on one side of the, of the molecule, wouldn't that make that side of the molecule negative? Yes. And the other side of the molecule, because it doesn't have electrons, it only sees the nucleus. So that side's going to be positive. Yes. But because the electrons are dispersed randomly, that is only a temporary positioning of the electrons. So if I'm looking at a molecule, I can have a molecule with one electron on the top of the molecule, one on the bottom further away, that has kind of a little bit of a difference in charges, but not much. I can look at another example where they're totally opposite one another. And if they're totally opposite one another, then there's no dipole because this side has an electron, this side has an electron. But I can also look at it where both of the electrons are on one side. If both of the electrons are on one side of the molecule, then that has a slight negative charge. The other side has a slight positive charge. Now, if I've got one molecule that is negative and has a positive end, if I put that next to another molecule, aren't the electrons from the second molecule going to be pulled towards the positive end of the other molecule? Which makes another positive side, which means the next molecule in the chain also has its electrons pulled. So you can develop a situation where you have these temporary charges, but they're affecting the other molecules down the chain. So that you get this negative, positive, negative, positive effect going on. Now, if it's temporary, I've said this is temporary. They exist for an instant. This molecule for an instant, the electrons are here, then they flip back. If it's only temporary, why does it matter? It matters because we're dealing with a whole bunch of molecules. If I'm dealing with the moles worth, I'm dealing with 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. It's the collective, the collectiveness of this small force. If we add a whole bunch of molecules to it, it adds up. So if it's a temporary force, it's a very, very small force but by the same token, we're dealing with a whole bunch of molecules, so it is in effect. Now, by a definition, you're going to hear something called polarizability. What that means is that's the ease in which the electrons can move within the molecule in response to an external change. Just a definition if it comes up. 
Now, if we have large atoms, don't large atoms have a whole bunch more electrons than small atoms? If I'm dealing with sodium as opposed to francinium, francinium has a larger number of electrons. So if I have a larger number of electrons, that's gonna up the charge part. If it ups the charge part, we're going to have a greater force. Larger molecules have stronger dispersion forces than smaller molecules. So if I'm dealing with xenon versus helium, which one is going to have the stronger force? Which one is larger? Uh, Danny. Yes, sir. Danny. Sure. Between xenon and helium, which molecule is larger? Xenium. Xenon is. Okay. Now, if xenon is larger, does it have stronger dispersion forces or weaker? I would say stronger. It's stronger. So, to boil it, if it has stronger forces, one molecule to another, to boil it, am I going to have to put in more energy? I think more energy. Absolutely. If something is larger, it has a greater dispersion force. If it has a greater dispersion force, there is a stronger attraction, one molecule to another. How do we get something to boil? We got to separate the molecules. We got to break these dispersion forces. If the force is stronger, we need to put more energy into it. Therefore, we need to have a larger boiling point. That is why xenon boils at a much higher temperature than helium does. I have a quick question. I'm here. Um, so helium would need less energy to boil. Okay. Okay. So doesn't it make sense? Is it yes. 4.2 Kelvin less energy than 165 Kelvin? Yes. It's like 40 times less. Mm -hmm. So if it's, if it's less energy going in, then there must have been less dispersion forces attracting one helium molecule to another. Okay, thank you. Now, size is one effect. There's also having something to do with shape. All right, when you're packing things, when you're going on a trip, is it easier, can you pack more things in closer if they're all the same shape? If we have similar sized boxes, can we get more in? Come yeah. on, some of these guys are easy. Yes. Yeah. All right. Now, if I try and put a bicycle into the trunk, am I going to be able to put less boxes in there? If I try and put one bi two bicycles in my trunk, I may be able to put 30 boxes in my trunk, but I can only get one bicycle because they don't mesh up evenly. So the shape of the molecule has something to do with, the shape has something to do with how many molecules we can pack in tighter. And remember, if we're packing them in tighter, the radius for one molecule compared to the other is smaller. So if I've got two molecules that are in a nice linear arrangement, like n-pentane, I can pack the n-pentanes closer to one another. This is going to, if they're closer, the radius is closer, then my force is greater. If the force is greater, n-pentane is going to take a higher temperature to boil than something like neopentane. I can't pack them in as tight. If I can't pack them in as tight, then my radius is smaller, is larger. 
If my radius is larger, this means less force. Less force means that it is going to boil at a lower temperature. Is this making sense, guys? Does anybody have any questions about dispersion? It's kind of hard to wrap your head around because it doesn't, sit, it doesn't really make sense that this is a temporary charge. And since it's temporary, it shouldn't matter. But it is temporary. And because we have a whole large number of molecules, that's why it matters. I don't understand what is meant by a temporary charge. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, who's speaking? Um, Natalia. All right, Natalia. Would you agree that we don't know where the electrons are in a, an atom? Right. Okay, we don't know. So is it possible they could both be on one side of the molecule? Yes. All right, they're not gonna permanently be on that one side of the molecule because they move around. Right, Natalia? Yes. So if they move around, they're gonna go back to their original position or they could be on the other side of the molecule. Does mm -hmm. that make sense to you? Yes, it does. It's temporary because the electrons are moving within the molecule constantly. Okay, so they don't have like a set spot for them. So that's why Absolutely. it's- Absolutely. Okay. You got that down. Thank you. Anything else, ladies and gentlemen? Okay, is Vanessa here? Daniela, Shari, Nicole, Jessica, Natalie Ocampo, and Delexis. Any of those people here? Good enough, they're marked absence. Jordan. Yes. Natalia's here. Danny's here. Benita. Benita. Gianna. Gianna. I'm here. Jenna. Here. Jennifer. I'm here. Manuel. Here. Parker. Here. Samantha. Here. Araceli. Here. Keanu. Keanu. Valeria. I think you just asked me the question. Anaya. Here. Jenna. Here. Leonardo. Here. Uh, other Natalie. Natalie number one. Here. Uh, I'm going to butcher this. Sachari? Here. You said it right. Ah, good for me. <laughs> Raylena? Here. Rhea? Here. Emily? Here. And Ethan? Here. So whoever was bothering me about calling the roll again, stop doing it. Guys, uh, something I did forget to mention. I do like to kid around, guys. I like to kid around with you. If I offend you, please let me know right away because I don't want it to fester and create a bad relationship. True story. I had a Chem One lab and I was talking with a girl and she was really worried about organic chemistry. And I said, organic chemistry is nothing. Do you like to cook? And she said, yeah. I said, well, when you're making an omelet, you kind of take all of the ingredients you're gonna put in the omelet and you kind of fry them up, put them to the side. Then you take an egg, break it up, put it into a bowl, add a little milk to it kind of like start the egg off, then you put all your fried stuff on, and you've got an omelet, right? Organic chemistry is the same thing, only instead of using food, you're using chemicals. Well, unbeknownst to me, I heard, I, I, I 
my, this conversation was overheard by another student. Four months later, I read in Air My Pitches, Mr. Popovich is a chauvinist pig. He wanted to make sure that this one girl went to cooking class rather than chemistry. And I'm like reading this and I'm going, are you for real? First of all, it was a conversation that didn't involve you. And second of all, you waited four months to be able to say that while you're just festering on you. So please guys, I say that story because if I do say, I'm gonna be kidding around with you. If I say something that offends you, please tell me right away. Okay, now we've talked about dispersion. Are dispersion forces temporary or permanent? Temporary. Temporary. Now, if you're going to weigh the amount of force between something that's temporary and something that's permanent, which force would you say has a greater strength? Permanent. So that's what we're going to talk about next. When we have a dipole-dipole force, we are dealing with permanent charges. Now, who mentioned electronegativity a second or three ago? I did. Uh, who is I? Guys, oh. you have to understand, when you say I did, Manual. that doesn't mean anything to me. <laughs> Manual. Thank you, Manual. This is where electronegativity comes into effect. So if I have a more electronegative element, is that going to want electrons more than a less electronegative element? Yes. Manual? Yes. Yes. And what we're talking about, we're not talking about ionic compounds. Because in an ionic compound, one element is so electronegative, it just steals the electrons from the other one. We're talking about covalent molecules here where electrons are shared. So if one of the elements has more electronegativity, it's going to pull the electrons towards it. If it pulls the electrons towards it, that side of the molecule is going to be negative. The other side is going to be electron deprived, so it's going to be positive. This is a permanent thing. The side that is negative will always be negative. The side that is positive will always be positive. So since it is a permanent development, since it's a permanent thing, the dipole-dipole forces are stronger than dispersion forces. You also have to understand dipole-dipoles molecules also have dispersion forces. They have both. Uh, yeah, went through everything else here. So, uh, the, except the last one. So riddle me this, this is a thinking question. Since we said permanent forces are stronger than temporary ones, then dipole-dipole forces are stronger than dispersion-dispersion. Do we got that? Are, that is, are we good on that one? Yes. Okay, now, if dipole-dipole are stronger forces, is a dipole-dipole molecule uh, compound going to be, going to have a stronger, a higher boiling point or a lower boiling point than something that just has dispersion? Higher. Dipole-dipole are going to be higher because the force is stronger. So if I have formaldehyde, Formaldehyde has an oxygen within it. Oxygen's very electronegative. Ethane, on the other hand, has just carbons and hydrogens. As a general rule, carbons and hydrogens don't have enough electronegative force to really affect one another. They share the electrons virtually equally. So since my formaldehyde has oxygen in it, I've got a negative. I've got a negative side to this molecule and a positive. 
I have a dipole dipole. For the ethane, I don't have a dipole dipole. I only have dispersion. So the force between one ethane and another is less than the force between a one formaldehyde and another. Understand this. These are negative numbers. Negative 88 is a lower temperature than negative 19.5. So therefore, this is a higher temperature. It takes more energy to break up the dipole-dipole forces than the straight ethane. Understand the same thing happens with melting points, going from a solid to a liquid. This temperature is much lower than the formaldehyde because the force between one formaldehyde and another one is so much stronger that you have to add more energy to it. Questions on that? Part of the effects can be seen in solubility. Okay, you've heard, have you heard the expression, like dissolves like? Have you heard that expression before? All right, now, in order to get mixing, in order to get mixing or dissolution of one liquid to, for the other, what I have to do is in my water, I have one water that's linked to another water because we have dipole dipoles, right? I have one pentane with another pentane. They're also together linked by dispersion forces. In order for me to get mix, to mix them up, I have to break the dipole dipole of water and I have to, in order to get one pentane between the waters. I have to break those dispersion to get a pentane between the two. Likewise, I have to break the pentane forces to get that pentane in between the two waters. Does this make sense to you all? Now, breaking bonds is endothermic. You have to put energy in. So in order to break the water-water force, I need to put energy in. In order to break the dispersion dispersion force, I have to put energy in. Now, what happens is when I make a new force, when I put the pentane between the two waters, that is creating force, that is exothermic. In the case of pentane versus water, the exothermic action is not big enough to overcome the endothermic. In other words, it takes more energy to break the water-water force and the pentane-pentane force than I get back by making the pentane-water-pentane-water pentane water force. Does that make sense to you all? Is that, by the way, I should have a five, does that make sense to you all limit? If somebody counts that I've done more than five, does that make sense to you? You get an extra point in your quiz, I'm trying to break myself of that habit. But can you see that that's, the, that's why, that's what's happening. So if I have something with only dispersion forces and something with dipole, dipole, they're not going to mix because the force between the molecule with only dispersion and the one with the dipole dipole isn't great enough to overcome the breaking of the force of the dipole to the dipole. On the other hand, if I have something like salt, which has a permanent positive sodium and a negative chlorine, I got something with a lot of charge on it. I also have waters that are charged, a positive end and a negative end. Here, we have to break the water-water, dipole-dipole bond, 
and the sodium chlorine ionic bond. Then we put a sodium in between the two waters. That is able, that has more force than the breaking of the bonds. So that is why like dissolves like, and like does not dissolve unlike. And I just use this slide to make that explanation. And that one. Polar versus nonpolar. In a nonpolar, there's no dipole-dipole energy. There's nothing to overcome the dispersion forces between the nonpolar molecules. It doesn't work. Do we have an understanding here? Anybody need me to explain this further? Okay. Now, we have a special dipole-dipole bond. It's called hydrogen bonding. There are molecules out there in which hydrogen is bonded to certain elements. Those elements are nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine have such a strong electronegativity that there is a stronger negative force for the electronegative elements pulling those electrons away. We have a stronger negative side and therefore a stronger positive side. This leads to higher partial positive and partial negative charges. Again, if the charges are higher from Coulomb's law, we know that the force is greater. So these are special, special molecules. If hydrogen is bonded, it has to be bonded to one of these three elements, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. We basically have a super dipole-dipole bond. Remember, it is not an actual bond. One water is not actually bonded to another water. This is just the force that's holding them to. It's just called hydrogen bonding. So if I'm looking at two molecules, if I have water, the hydrogen end doesn't have the electrons as long, as much. Those electrons reside on the oxygen. So I've got a negative side to the molecule. I have a positive side. So if I have a negative and a positive side, then I am going to, with my water, I'm going to be able to attract one positive side, one hydrogen side, to the negative end of water. Similarly, if I have, this is an ethane, ethanol molecule. I have an alcohol. In an alcohol, a hydrogen is bonded to an oxygen. I have all, the, all I need to make a hydrogen bond. In this one, the positive hydrogen also is attracted to the negative oxygen. That's all I have to have in order to have a hydrogen bond occur. This makes water the miracle compound. Let's think about this. Does ice float, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. Okay, in order for something to float, doesn't it have to be less dense than the other thing? Yes. 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 Can you think of some other compound in which the solid form is less dense than the liquid form? Remember, solids, we're really jamming them in there. If we're jamming them close together, then it's going to be more dense. I cannot think of another example on this earth of a compound whose solid is less dense than its liquid. Why does that happen? Okay. 
when we're making ice, when you make a solid crystal, what happens is the solid puts the individual molecules in place. There is an absolute radius between the mo one molecule to another. When you have a liquid, you don't have this rigid structure. So the liquid is free to move. Now, since water has such a strong dipole-dipole moment, it packs it really in close when it's a solid. I'm sorry, excuse me, erase that. When it's a liquid, it's free to move. If it's free to move, it's gonna move closer to one another. If it moves closer to one another, that means that the liquid density is bigger than the solid, which is restricted by this crystalline structure. So that is the specific reason why ice floats. There is no godly reason why water shouldn't be a gas. There is no reason on earth. What's the, what is the atomic weight or the molecular weight of water? Come on, guys. Is it, is it 18? 18, okay. What about carbon dioxide? 44. 44. All right, which one is a gas at room temperature? CO2. CO2 is. It weighs about two and a half times more than water does. And yet it's a gas while water is a liquid. Think about it. If water wasn't a liquid, would our bodies exist? We'd have nothing to transport things from one thing to another. So if you look at things, hydrogen fluoride, it weighs less than water does. Yet it boils at a lower temperature. Ammonia, again, lower, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, lower, Molecular weight, it boils less. And you have all of these other compounds that weigh more than water does. Yet these things are all gases. These things are all gases and water is a liquid simply because of hydrogen bonding. Other effects, because of hydrogen bonding, it takes more energy to melt or boil water than it does most other substances that are similar. What this means is you have to put more energy to raise a gram of water one degree Celsius, which is the definition of a calorie. If it takes more energy to do that, then it is more resistant to heat change, to, to temperature change. That way, our bodies can exist in 80 degree Fahrenheit weather without changing our body temperature anything. If we take ourselves and move us instantly into Milwaukee where it is minus 32, our core body temperature doesn't change that much because it has a high specific heat. Another thing about water, it has a high capillary action. We'll talk about capillary action uh, at the end of class on Thursday. It has strong adhesion and cohesion properties. We'll talk about capillary action later on, but what this does is this allows water to go up a plant stock. Water, Anybody ever see the musical um, Wicked? Nope. 
the big song, the big song at the end of act one is something called defying gravity. That is what water is able to do because of its strong adhesion and cohesion properties, because it has hydrogen bonds, it is able to move up the stalk of a plant and defy gravity. The other thing is, has anybody heard of bugs being able to walk on water? Nobody? Yes. The reason they're able to do this is water has, because of its strong hydrogen bonding, water is able to make a very, 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 very strong surface tension. The surface tension is so great that a bug can literally be on the surface of water and stand. You can walk, bugs can walk on water. Last one, I got three minutes left. I can finish this up in this time. We've already discussed ion dipole in, or you've already discussed ion dipole in chem one. Basically when you started talking about dissolving ionic compounds in water. In an ion dipole force, you have not only a permanent charge, but you have a charge that's all it has the whole charge. If I have sodium chloride, that sodium has all of that one plus charge and the chlorine has all of that one minus charge. Since it has all of that charge, the force is greater. So when we're dealing with ion dipole forces, we have a greater force than hydrogen bonding, which is a greater force than dipole dipole, which is a greater force than dispersion. The ions control all of the charge. When we're in a dipole, we're still sharing that charge a little bit. The stronger, the partial charge on the dipole is attracted to the oppositely charged ion. And the stronger the charges you have, the stronger the force. Therefore, the ion dipole is going to be a stronger force. Once more, the closer the two particles are, the stronger the force. So to summarize, what we're dealing with in intermolecular forces, dispersion, temporary charges. It occurs because the electrons move to one side of the molecule on a temporary basis. If it's on one side of the molecule, it can affect another molecule, which affects another molecule. But again, these are temporary forces. As such, they're fairly weak. Dipole, dipole, we have a moving of the electrons towards the more electronegative element. It doesn't control that charge 100%, but it controls most of the charge. So permanently within that dipole, dipole, we have a positive end of the molecule and a negative end. They are stronger than dispersion. Then we deal with hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding, special case. The hydrogen has to be bonded to, the, to either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. It makes a stronger bond because the fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen holds on to more of the electrons than the hydrogen. Stronger charge, stronger force. So it's even stronger than dipole, dipole. Last, we have ion dipoles, where we have a permanent charge, which controls all the charge in the ion, and the dipole being one that has a partial charge. That is strongest. So in terms of strength, dispersion is the weakest, dipole, dipole next, hydrogen bonding, ion dipole. Which one do you think is going to take the, mo the highest boiling point? Ion dipole. Ion dipole is going to have the, the highest, the highest boiling point. And we're going to see this when we get into solutions uh, next. 
doing that then. I believe next Thursday. Pretty much, guys, we're going to get through a chapter in one and a half periods. If you don't understand something, stop me, ask questions. Because if I'm not getting questions, I'm going to continue rambling on. By the way, if you weren't here, I did look up the class. It does begin at 1015. I apologize for making you come early today. Uh, understand that the class will begin at 1015 on Thursday. That means that my office hours are from 945 until 1015. I open the Zoom meeting at 945. If you have questions, please feel free to log in then. I send the invitations out at 945. So please log on then. You can ask me individually questions then. Or if you need to address me one-to-one, -one, I'll be happy to talk to you one-to-one uh, -one at another time. I have a question. I'm here. Sorry, who's going? Oh, wait. Um, for the lectures, are they usually on Thursdays at the same time? Tuesdays, Thursdays, ten fifteen to twelve twenty. Okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You've signed up for a live online class. Live online class means right. That's okay. That you're supposed to be here when it's scheduled. Um, I just have a question about the Zoom meetings. Are you sending a invite every single time or yes. we can? Okay. Yes. And I have a question about the lab. Um, just to make sure there's no lab today. No lab today. You have to email me. If you're planning on missing Thursday, you have to definitely have to email me today or you're going to be marked absent. If you're marked absent, that means you're going to be withdrawn from the class. So it's important. All right. Yes, thank you. Anything else, ladies and gentlemen? Oh, yeah, Professor, I had a question. On Canvas, when I go to view the lab for this class and I, I checked it with the registration, it's the same number. For some reason, it's coming up as another professor's class for last really? semester. And I, I didn't know it was just for me or if it was for anybody else. Is anybody I, else running into that problem? I am. Yeah, I just looked at mine. It's, it's somebody like named Dr. Dr. Lou. Yeah. And Dr. it's a. Dr. It's a, Lou? Lou? Yeah. Uh, okay. I you don't know if that's like. No, no, no. A you're on the online. Issue. Okay, time out. You're in the online class, right? Yes. All yes. right. That's, it's not a problem. Uh, what happens is uh, Dr. Lou has um, he designed the course. And he put his template in there and I downloaded that. So you're going to see a lot of information he has that is really and truly superfluous. So I didn't even bother eliminating it. Okay. Uh, I will, I will go in and hide that from you. So you're not bothered by it. Oh, well, also all the, all of the dates and the due dates were for um, like January to May. That will be taken care of. Okay. Okay. I, I will take care of it. And those of you that are in the face to face class, there's not much in your class yet either. I was, I would, I, to be, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Between semesters, uh, I took a little vacation to Savannah, and uh, that took up all my time between the semesters. And I'm, I'm in the process of catching up. That's part of what I'm using this off day doing. So I, it will be up. It will be up. Uh, if not today, it will be up tomorrow and I will be fixing the dates. So, so for the lab, is there anything we have to do before the meeting on Thursday morning? Uh, nothing really. Okay. If you are, if you're in a, you're on the online class. Yes. Technically speaking, that is not like this class. That class is listed as an online class, which means technically speaking, you do not have to show up for the meetings. I will be recording them so that, uh, so that you'll be able to have access to my little speech on each individual experiment. 
You will have that access through the recording. I would like you to show up. I can't even demand that you show up on Thursday. I would like you to because I'm going to be going through the same sort of thing, the syllabus, the rules of the class and such. And it makes sense to at least to show up on that day. But if you don't want to, there's nothing I can do to force you. I can't take, I can't take attendance on that class because I can't hold you to it. Again, if you are attending the class though, you have the opportunity to ask, ask questions and I'm teaching it to you directly. It's an advantage. Uh, which is what, Raylena? Raylena, are you there? By the way, guys, class has ended. You can go if you'd like. Raylena, are you out there? Yes, you are. I see you. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, this is what I had to talk to you about. Do you mind talking with everybody listening in, or do you want to wait until everybody goes? Oh, that's fine. Uh, basically, uh, since you signed in for the online class, I cannot dictate a period of time that you have to show up. Okay, does that make sense, Relina? Yeah. All right. This is a little bit selfish on my part. I teach this class from 1015 to 1220. I then have to drive from my home in St. Petersburg to my face-to-face -face class at um, Dale Mabry. And that class begins at two and lasts until 4.30, at which time I have to drive back here. Okay. Now, my Monday classes at SPC end at eight in the evening. So selfishly, I'd like to eat dinner at a normal time on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I had to find a slot in which I could give a meeting. So that's why I chose 8 a.m. And that's why I wanted you to listen to this. Okay, Relina? That's the, that's the reason it's at that God awful time of eight o'clock. I don't, I don't have a problem meeting there. I just wanted to make sure, um, because I'd like to go to the meetings. I just wanted to make sure that that was like, what was going to happen. That's pretty permanent. Yes. Okay. I will, as a general rule, my, um, Jennifer, did you have me for lab? Did you have me face to face or online? Jennifer, are you still here? Uh, and I know Samantha was face to face. Uh, sorry, I can't give you an example of how long the class is. Usually, no, definitely no more than an hour and a half. And that is really pushing it. I generally try and keep my lectures in a lab to about an hour or less. Okay, so that's how long you're going to have to put up with me. Anybody else have any other questions? Remember, quiz one is due on Thursday. The three forum things are due on Sunday. I believe that is all. Let me, I'm going to end this share here. And I'm going to try and get back to the dashboard. I don't believe that we, you have anything else to do other than that. I know the homework. Um, the introduction to mastering, it may say Thursday's date, but that's not a strict date. It may just say that that's when it's due. Uh, that has been extended because I know that you guys are gonna have trouble getting it. Um, a question. I'm here. Is all the homework and assignments we have do gonna be paused on Canvas or we gotta go through? My, you have to go through my lab and mastering. You have to get into Canvas. Who ties that? I'm sorry, Manuel? Who ties that? Is any other assignment gonna be paused on Canvas besides the homework we have? The quizzes? The quizzes yes. are due. Uh, the discussion forums are due. Those are the main things that you're going to have to worry about. 
quizzes, tests, canvas, right? So we're gonna see that it's coming up and we're not yes. gonna have to go through assignments and look them up individually. The only thing you have to do is the quiz on May 20th and okay. you do have to answer the survive, uh, scavenger hunt questions. You have to go into the discussion for the scout. You have to pull up the scavenger hunt. And the scavenger hunt is basically, I'm trying to get you guys used to the, used to using the chat room. And I'm trying to get you having a relationship with one another. So I've got 10 questions I'm asking this week. You have to answer those 10 questions in the forum by Sunday, then the week after that, I'm gonna take the answers you give me in the scavenger hunt and I'm gonna ask 10 more questions. And basically the questions in the scavenger hunt is, uh, how, where were you born? Okay, so in the second session, Based upon that question, I'm going to ask you who was born the furthest from Tampa. And if you come up with the same answer that I come up with, and you get the most of these questions correct, that means that you're going to get five points extra credit on the quiz. Tie votes split the extra credit questions. So you're going to need to do the scavenger hunt this Sunday, next Sunday, you're gonna to have to do the prize for the scavenger hunt. So those are the four things you're generally gonna to have to do each week. Okay, Danny, you only have to do quiz one for Thursday. Okay, thank you. And the scavenger hunt for Sunday. I will come up with a new announcement on Sunday. Anybody else have any more questions, guys? When is the introduction to mastering chemistry homework assignment going to be due? We can look it up. I think in this in the temporary schedule, I put it for Wednesday. I you believe if you look in the temporary for uh, in the schedule, it will be Wednesday. Uh, if you Look at the actual assignment. I have it set for the 20th. No, that's going to be changed. Sorry. We'll do that right now. Uh, let's get out of there. What would be reasonable, do you think? Understand that I have your first real homework assignment due on the 27th. Is it reasonable for me to say that everybody's going to get it and it's going to be due by the 24th? Yes. Is that reasonable, guys? Yeah, that's fine. You're answering for all your classmates. So we're going to move this to the 24th. And this is going to move to Yep. Okay. Any other questions, guys? I will see you on Thursday then. Some of you at eight, some of you at 10:15 at not 10:15. That's all we got, guys. Um, I have a question. Please. I'm here as long, as long as you have questions. I'm here. Um, so not for this week and or next week, but for the week, the weeks after, we have to answer in the um, in the discussion three times. You said right. Yes. But not for the the next this week. Not for the next two okay. weeks. No. Thank you. And what I'm going to do for those for come on, it's going to be hard for you to actually have actual questions. 
So what I do is I kind of prime the pump by, uh, do you remember those, those uh, um, problems that I showed you, those extra problems? What I'll do is I will put three of the, list three of those in, the, uh, in separate discussions. So you can answer the, instead of just trying to go through the regular form, you can respond by answering one of the homework problems. Okay. So it doesn't matter which one, you just have to answer three times. Okay. Three responses is all you need. And honestly, some of you are gonna, if, if you like this, some of you are gonna be on there more because realistically speaking, you may be asking questions or you may be answering. Some people like to give answers. I have one girl in the fall semester that loved, a smart girl, loved being able to help people. So she was on the forum constantly trying to help people out. I'm hearing no questions, guys. Okay, if that's all. If that is all, guys. Thank you. Take care. I will see you on Thursday.